as I, as I, as I teased in the email, I'm going to do something a little different. So I took my own advice that I gave you last week, which I'm sure everybody watches the recordings religiously. Although there is, we do have one member, uh, Maggie Newman, God bless her, watches religiously. She likes to do it while she's doing house stuff. And one, and I realized that she's not on the main list and I since have added her, but she said, um, what, there was no shit this week. I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't have it this year. <laughs> She was looking for it, like looking for it. Um, and Maggie's in Italy now. I hope you're having a good trip, Maggie. Hope you can watch us, you know, in uh, in Italian. So last week I said everybody should read this book, Erica's book of leadership in the wilderness, because it's really outstanding. And so I took my own advice and I was rereading it and looking at chapters. And then she had this fascinating insight, something that I've never really thought a lot about. And I was reminded of it. And I said, you know what, it's, it's for this kind of like, summer cool type of learning, I think it would be very, very appropriate. So um, to, to give you the framework, there are two episodes specifically in Bamidbar in very close proximity to one another, where we have the presence of, or it's a narrative that revolves around animals. Not about animals, but animals actively involved in the narrative. So, would you just say, "Oh, yeah, we have the para aduma"? Para aduma is not really an animal in the in the narrative. Para aduma is just about an offering that you have to bring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about where live animals got involved in the action. Okay, so one is going to be in our parsha, of course, as the inspiration for Shrek as you know the talking donkey and the other one is probably a little lesser known so let's look at that first so if you have the chumash let's turn to the bottom of page 848 848 it's perik aleph pasuk dalit 21.4 as if there wasn't enough going on in last week's parsha with miriam dying and the and 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 the golden and the the paraduma and and the chet of Meimariva, and then Aaron dying. So of course we have to like squeeze in and a couple of wars. Let's squeeze in also one more complaining episode. Okay, so it says here, pasuk dalit on the bottom. Vayisu um, mehar hahar derech yamsuf lizbov of eretz adom batiktar nevesham baderech. Now remember they're trying to go through these main things. They're going the king's road, the whole bit. Nobody lets them in, and they're going to pay for it later on. We're not going to step on your flowers. We're going to pay for whatever we take, that whole bit. No. So they went from Har Har They went by the Sea of Reeds to go around the land of Edom. And the spirit of the people grew short on the way because, you know, they're schlepping around. This is, this is year 40. They want to get into the land of Israel. Not quite getting there. And, you know, like when, if you've ever taken a long road trip. So let's say, you know, our family this year, we, for some sugar reason, we drove to Florida during winter break. It was something you have to do once in your lifetime. Okay, that that's what tells you that you'll never do it again. So getting to Florida is fine, but getting from like Jacksonville to Orlando is like you want to rip your hair out because like you know you're there, but you're not there. And then it's like, come on already, come on already. So you kind of have that feeling um over here. So then what happens? So they spoke against God, against Moshe, and here's the same refrain. Why did you bring us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? By the way, this is 40 years later. 40 years, people making the same complaints, which is also indicative of Jewish organizational life, is that people make the same complaints generation after generation, okay? Why did you bring us up from Egypt, you know, four decades ago, so we should die in the wilderness? Like, we, come on, you made it this far. Have some faith. No, there's no food. There's no water. Our soul's disgusted with this insubstantial food. Lechem hakelokel. Um, what is, why is it called lechem hakelokel? Um, so if you look in the note at the bottom, the insubstantial food, they claim that the mana and even the water was a heavenly food. And though it was suited to the spiritual life of the wilderness, it couldn't sustain them for the heavy agricultural work that they would have to do in the future. Rashi says, it's how that that man was nivla be'evarim kuruk lokel that it was absorbed in the um, absorbed in your in your limbs or something like that. Okay. Anyway, the truth is is it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're eating man for forty years, you know what's for dinner tonight? Man a la man, man surprise, <laughs> right? Uh, 
<laughs> mon with a side of mon. So you, know, you can understand people get fed up, but why dafka now? Anyway, so this is, and now there's no reaction. There's no response. They just complain. We have immediate punishment. God sent the fiery serpents. The fiery serpents, these, I don't know, they're like snakes on fire. I don't know what's going on there. Against the people, they bit the people, and a lot of people died. So then they came to Moshe. Moshe, Moshe, so the people said, oh, my God, we're tired. We made a mistake. Moshe, we sinned. We spoke against Hashem and against you. Pray to Hashem that he removes the serpent. So Moshe prays for the people. Remember, we saw this last time. This Vais Palel, Moshe, one of the few times Vais Palel for them. Then Vayomer Hashem El Moshe, Asel Chosaraf, Vesim Oso Al Nes, Vahaya Kol Hanashuch, Vera O Sovachai, Vayas Moshe Nechash Nechoshes, Vaisameo Al Hanes, Vahaya Im Nashach Hanachoshes, Ish, Vihibit El Nechash Hanachoshes, Vahai. Right? So he says, now you make for yourselves a fiery serpent, put it on a pole, okay, and it will be. Wow. Wow. And it will be that anyone who is bitten will look at it and live. Okay. So um, we're, we're on page, Eliana, we're on page 850. Eliana Margalit Clibben Office joined us. I'm just letting you know. So now I have to be on my best behavior. So um, he says, Okay, put, take the fiery serpent, put it on a pole, and I'll be that anyone who was bitten will look at it and live. So he made a serpent of copper and he placed it on the poles. So it was that when the serpent bit a man, he would stare at the copper serpent and lived. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's a nutty story. And it's one I've never paid much attention to. But what's what comes out of this? What's the, what's the most famous thing that comes out of this? The, the medical symbol. Right, the, the medical symbol. symbol. The symbol for that. There's, there's a name for it. Smart people, smart people here on the on the, you are, you guys are all smarter than me. What, what's it called? What's it called? There's a thing for it. My parents are both medical doctors, and I don't know this, and I've seen it my whole life. Somebody, please, somebody, somebody, Google it, please. If you're not on the camera, please Google it, so I don't see that you're googling it. Um, there's a thing. For, this is what you get for not staying at school. Okay. Hey Siri, what's that? Mean? Assist. The what? Say it again. Cad Assus? Yes, Cad yes, 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 yes. I don't know how to pronounce, but that's it. Yes. <laughs> Me Married to a doctor, mother of a doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> um, of course, my, uh, well, I have a great story about Mark Miller one day, but I can't tell it in the setting, but I have a great story about Mark Miller um, <laughs> relating to his medical profession. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so that's, so it, it's, it's a very strange thing. Like, look at now. Now, Rashi tells us, and it's going to be the lesson here. It's actually Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah. Rashi says, um, it's in the first column. It's about, I don't know, it's almost two thirds of the way down. Do you think the snake really causes you to live or die? Rather, when they would turn their direction towards heaven, and they would mishabdim as lipam, which means they would subjugate their hearts to their father in heaven. They would heal. Vimlav hayu namokim. And if not, yeah, no good. Okay. So what, or they say, ein hanachash memes el hachet memes. This is a favorite most of that Rebbe's used to give in yeshiva. It's not that would get the sin that kills you. They used to love to scare the sin out of us. It never, <laughs> ever worked, by the way. I think that sort of fear mongering, um, it, it, I mean, it works to a degree, but by and large, I think long term, it doesn't do, it doesn't work because the second you step out of the circle and you're not struck by lightning, as you were promised, then you're like, oh, OK, then my whole belief system falls apart. So that's a whole other conversation about chinuch, when is it the right time to use uh, Ahava? When is it the right time to use Yira, et cetera? Fine. But this is episode number one. Again, a lesser known episode, like you said, we don't because there's also there's so much going on in this Parsha. This is kind of like a throw-in. It's only like it's 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 one, two, three, four, five, six psukim, six verses amid eighty-seven. I think in this parsha of so much other action. It's right in the middle. It's the middle of the fifth aliyah. Eh, okay, so there, there, okay, fine. So um, 
um, what, I, what I have, I, I, we're going to look at some artwork later. Again, I'm channeling my uh, inner Erica Brown. As I, as I said, everybody, we should, we should all read her book. And in here, she actually has a section on the artwork here, which I'm going to share with you um, in a moment. The next section that deals with an animal as the focal point of the narrative, of course, is much, much more well known. No less bizarre, by the way, but that's this week's Parsha. So Balak... Balak now, and I, and I say this every year, is that people used to make fun of me because I, for a long time, I was a summer rabbi, meaning I was a rabbi in the summer community. So I was always, always on, never took off. And Balak is always one of those parshas. And when you're saying over and over, Bilam and Balak, it gets very confusing. So they always end up saying Balam and Bilak. And they make fun of me for that. Okay. But, you know, this is, this is my, my, uh, my Bilak to bear, Balak to bear. So um, Balak is, is a unique parsha because it does not, by and large, except at the very end, does not involve the Jewish people. This is an episode, an extraneous episode that does not deal with the Jewish people's interaction. They, it could be they had no idea this was going on until afterwards. And that's why the Gemara and Sota says that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote this parsha. We had to believe that uh, because you know it's not, not part of, it's, there's no commandments, there's no this, there's this guy, he's being hired to go and curse the Jewish people, and he's like, I'll go, I'm not going, God says you should go, God says don't go, it's very confusing, first God says don't go with them, and then he goes and God says go with them, or whatever, he's, and then he's like, well, no, I, I'm going to curse them, whatever I say, whatever God puts in my mouth, I'm going to do, uh, so he's like, he's a, he's a righteous guy, he's not a righteous guy, you know, the, the Gemara says that, that Bilam was on the same level of prophecy as Moshe, except that he was on the dark side, so if you want to go the whole like Star Wars-ish type of thing, uh, if you want to look there. But what, what's most notable, aside from the, that his curses end up being blessings, is, um, is the episode of, of Bilam with his, um, with his animal. Okay? So he finally, he, he, he's going to go. Um. Let's go. He finally goes, uh, let's say, bottom of 858. So we're going to look. If you're in the Chumash, it's Perak Chav Beis, chapter 22, verse 20. So it's, if you're in the Stone Chumash, it's 858. 858, almost towards the bottom. Pasuk Chav, verse 20. So this is after at the very beginning, and he hires him, and God appears to him at night. He's like, don't go. Don't, don't mess with them. They're a blessed nation. You know, don't mess. Anyway, so he says, finally, he realizes maybe his resolve is going to go. He's like, okay, Hashem appears to him at night. If the men come and they summon you, arise, go with them. But whatever, only do what I tell you. This should not, and this is, a, it seems like, an innocuous verse, but it should not be lost on us. He gets up in the morning and he saddled his own donkey and he went with the officers of Moab. Why is that important? Oh, 32 years ago, you said. Oh, yeah, she learned this. That Abraham himself, when he went to go do the will of God, he also it says, reason makdim and the mitzvahs. Is that when it comes to a mitzvah, you, the, the, the phrase is, mitzvah habal yadacha al tach mitzena. Al-Tachmitzen, is a fancy word meaning don't let it uh, slip away, but like the word chametz, don't let it get chametz. You have to rush. You have 18 minutes. You have to make everything happen quickly. Don't chametz up the mitzvah that, have, that comes your way. So he does it himself. He, uh, he doesn't have an attendant. He does it himself. Okay, now 860. <laughs> By the way, you can make a tremendous amount of comparisons between this, if you want to take literary comparisons between this and the episode of the Akeda, because look what happens here. God tells him and he goes and he saddles his own thing. Hashem gets angry and Hashem and an angel of Hashem stood on the road. An angel appears in the middle of the narrative telling him what to do. And he's trying to impede him. They're also the angel in, in the Akeda wanted to stop Avram from bringing it. And by the way, look what it says. He's riding Ushnei Ne'er Rav Imo, and he also has two lads. Remember, uh, Avraham said to, to, to the, he says, Atem Yeshu Po, Vani Vanaron El go, we're going to go, you guys stay here, to Ne'er like, like, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things. And by the way, 
it's no secret then that the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, I believe it is in the fifth chapter, the Mishnah says, you want to be like the disciples of Avraham Avinu or the disciples of Bilam. Interesting comparison. The two people that the Mishnah would pick to compare, these two. Here you have it in the verse. The verse itself leads you to that connection because using that same um, literary uh, devices, etc. So God is angry for, at Bilam for going, but he just told him to go. He shouldn't have gone. Forget about that. But let's say he's going, and Hashem told him he shouldn't have gone. And he's riding on the donkey, and the two men are with him. The donkey sees the angel of Hashem standing on the road with a sword drawn in his hand. So the donkey turns away from the road and goes into the field. So what did Bilam do? He strikes the she-donkey to turn it back on the road. Okay, so let's just, we understand what's going on here. Donkey sees the angel. Bilam doesn't see the angel. Donkey stops or tries to go somewhere the other way. And, and he starts beating the animal. Now, by the way, when you think about an animal that is stubborn, what's the, it's not a donkey that we think of. It's a mule. So before we go further, and we could read uh, Erica's excellent analysis on this. Um, what do you, when you hear the term donkey, what do you associate? If you compared someone to a donkey. Stupid. Stupid, okay. Um, and we could fill in the blanks on however you want to refer to that, yeah. you know. And, and there's a reason why we have certain <laughs> colloquialisms that say that. Okay, um, you know, kind of a, like like a like a. I, I need you for the lowly type of schlepping. There's not much great quality there. Okay, even though even though, in certain places in Tanakh, the that certainly in the brachas that Yaakov gives to his sons in Parshas Vayechi, one in the Yisachar use the word donkey, but that's more from a, like a hasmada point of view for the, okay. to be endurance, dedication, um, persistence, okay? So the donkey here is the one that comes out looking pretty smart, not Bilam. Bilam's the one that looks like the donkey or maybe like the mule, but he, you know, he's stubborn like a mule, but it's a donkey. Okay, anyway, it, it, it's a wild story. Vayamod. <laughs> The angel of Hashem then stood in the path of the vineyard. It's a fence on this side, a fence on that side. Again, the sheet donkey sees the angel of Hashem pressed against the wall, and it pressed Bilam's leg against the wall. And what does Bilam do? He continues to hit the animal. Okay. Um, Oh, I have to tell him when our friend comes back. Like, it will make a great analogy for Israelis here. Um, Vayosef, um, Vayosef Malach Hashem Avor, Vayamod Bemakom Tsar, Asher Inderach Lintos Yamin Usmal. The angel of Hashem further went and stood in a narrow place. There was no room to turn left or right. Okay. So the, 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 the donkey's closing in on a place where the angel doesn't, have, there's nowhere to go. So what does Bilam do? He keeps hitting the animal, right? So we have a saying, I was just waiting for you to come back for this, but we have a saying that if Israel is like, if you're trying to fit something like a round peg into a square hole and it doesn't fit, what should you do? Bang it harder. <laughs> that's the Israeli method. So that's the, that's the, am I wrong? No, no. I can't say, okay. <laughs> am I? So the, the Bilam keeps hitting his animal. The she donkey sees the angel of Hashem crouched between and, and he crouched beneath Bill. I'm like, that's it, I'm not moving. He tries to go this way, hits him. He tries to go this way, crushed under the wall. Then he just stops. Bill gets angry and he, he strikes the animal with the staff. So three times we're told that, and this is very, very important. Three times we're told that the animal sees the angel. Three times tries to avoid encountering the angel or stopping or stopping its progress. And three times, Bilam hits the animal. So then 
ויפתח השם את פי האסון ותאמר לבלעם מעסיסי לך כי כיסה לי זה שלוש רגלים. Hashem opened the mouth of the Shidanki and says to Bilam, what have I done you stuck me these three times? Okay, now, without going as, as an ounce further, if you're riding, now, by the way, it shouldn't be that hard for us to, to relate to these days because our, our vehicles talk to us all the time. Most of the time, we probably ignore it. Rerouting, rerouting, finding a better route. But no, no, I don't want to, I want to go this way. You know, sometimes it, there, there's a certain level of, of accomplishment when you're, let's say, smarter than your GPS. Right when your GPS gets a little bit confused, or you're smarter than Waze, we have a phrase with the chaver. We say, "Oh, you know, I'm going somewhere. I beat Waze, <laughs> right? Because Waze, Waze, Waze gave me a nevua of this amount of time, and I got there faster. Waze also didn't anticipate that I was going to drive 100 miles an hour or something like that. But uh, whatever it is, so our, the, the fact that our cars talk to us maybe makes us a little bit more relatable. But if you're riding on an animal, on Mr. Ed, okay, and the animal after you hit the animal three times, the animal just stops and turns around and is like. Dude, wh what's up? Like, why do you keep hitting me? So if that happened, I don't know about you, but I would probably freak out and run away. I, I, I would, I would, uh, I, I would, you know, what? I'd be there in disbelief and shock or something. But Bilam just carries on the conversation like it's normal. He says, he says, no, because you mocked me. If only there was a sword in my hand, I would have killed you. The she donkey says to Bilam, am I not your she donkey that you have ridden upon me all your life until this day? Have I been accustomed to do such a thing to you? And he says, no. By the way, Chazal are a little bit graphic here. They say that, you know, they were more than friends. Let's put it, let's put it that way. Okay, they were a special, special relationship they had. So then, Vayigal Hashem es ene bilam, Vayar es malach Hashem nitzav baderch vecharbo shlufa biado, Vayikod vayishtachu leapov. Then Hashem uncovered, that's the key phrase that's going to be in both of these narratives actually is, Hashem uncovered the eyes of Bilam. He sees malach Hashem standing there with the sword drawn in his hand, he bows his head, he bows himself on his face. And then Hashem says, The angel of Hashem says, what reason did you strike your she donkey these three times? I tried to stop you, but you were trying to go in a different way to go, to go against me. In Lama Gimel, your donkey saw me and turned away from me three times. You shmendrick, you didn't even see that. If it hadn't turned away from me, I would now have even killed you. I would now even have killed you and let it live. In other words, you should thank your animal, not, you know. So then Bilam says to the angel, I have sinned, he says. I didn't know you were standing opposite me on the road, and now if it's evil in your eyes, I will return. And then the angel of Hashem, then he just says to him, go with them, but only the word that I speak to you, you shall speak, which is, of course, what happened. Now, this is very, this is very confusing because did he, Hashem appears to him at night and says, you can go with them, right? Go back, go back to Pasuk Chof Aleph, um, to Pasuk Chof, and he says, if they come, he says, go with them, just do whatever I tell you. Nothing has happened. He's just on the road and the Malach stops him and he keeps going. He hasn't said anything. He hasn't cursed anybody. He hasn't done anything. And in effect, the Malach just reiterates what the prophecy that was given to him in his dream was. So what was the whole point of the what was the whole point of the of the donkey episode? And the, as a matter of fact, the Mishnah also is the two famous Mishnahs that deal with this. The first one I mentioned, comparing Avraham and Bilam, and the second one, of course, that this mouth of the donkey, the donkey speaking, was one of the things that was created Bain Hashmashas in creation, right before Shabbos and creation. There were a number of miraculous things that were created, and this is one of them. Okay, let's have a little fun now. Before we get into the comparisons, let's have a little fun. So if you look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen here now. Um, I don't know if anybody realizes this,
but there's a famous Rembrandt painting of the episode of Billum. Okay, um, I'm sure you're all uh, experts in, uh, in Rembrandt. Let's see. Uh, oh, you see this one? Hold on. Yeah. Wait. Do you see? Do you see the? Wait. What do you see? Do you see on the screen the uh, the color picture? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. This is where you know we have a little fun. Okay. Now, this is Rembrandt. Okay. Pretty pretty famous picture, I think. A famous painter, at least. Um, all right, have at it. What do you see? This one I got in color, at least. Well, you see the obvious. Yeah. Well, you know, we just. Balapa, what are these two little guys in the shade? Because you have two people here. Oh, there's so many men. So he has an entourage with him. So they're behind him. And he's. Um, yeah, okay. So oh, it's hard the to sword, say. The sword is there. What? The what do you say? Is, the sword is prominent. There's a sword. Right. So the, so the, the, but if you notice, it's, it, it's historically accurate because from one sense that the angel has a sword, it says, but Bilam does not have a sword. Remember, he said, if I would have had a sword, I would have killed you. If you look carefully, he's only holding. Like it's, a a stick. Stick he, it's a stick that he uses to hit the donkey with. Correct. Correct. It's the donkey hitter sticker. Um, the donkey is crouched because it doesn't want to move anymore. This is this is the last straw. What are the like, papers in his bag? Yeah, that's funny. Huh? Do you see that satchel yeah. in the front? It looks like manuscripts or something. It's curses. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe he needs for his incantations. He needs, uh, you know, he doesn't know everything about pet. Mm -hmm. So he needs to, he needs to have some sort of, uh, I don't know. I don't know. The guy, now it seems that the guys in the background, you're right. It said, Arav, but it could be they had other people that are just going with the animals, et cetera. Maybe two people that are prominent and the rest are just sort of helpers, but they seem kind of clueless. Mm -hmm. They're obviously in the background. They're faded in the background. They don't know what's happening here. So, um, they're not seeing the angel, I assume. right? And what, what struck me as odd, though, is that I always had the impression that the angel was in front of him, right? Hmm. It was blocking his way, right? Now, here the angel is sort of like, as we normally think of an angel, sort of like over your shoulder, right? Or, or, or next to you, or aside from you, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's an unusual, uh, unusual graphic, but it could be that this is right before the 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 end of the story where they really confront one another and, and it's hard to say at what point in the narrative this painting takes place because you know he hits he's about to hit the animal which took place three times so it's definitely not before it, this is definitely not after Bilam recognizes the angel because if he was recognized the angel he wouldn't have hit him anymore right don't, in the actual text in the Chumash isn't only, I mean, I know Billam's the only one who can hear the donkey talking, but do the other, it almost seems like the other people behind him are looking at the angel. I always imagined it as it was something that only he was aware of. I, I mean, that's, that's what I think. I think they're just kind of like, well, traffic has stopped ahead of us and I don't know what's going on. Right. And is this, is this, is this donkey screaming here? Or is the donkey talking? Looks like he's complaining. Complaining? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, and and I mean the angel is very angelic, like this nice kind of cherubic face. But you know, all, always associate an angel with it with a sword. You you would associate sort of the angel of death with a sword, and you wouldn't say like white sort of light colored hair, cherubic type of face, right? It's it's interesting. I'm wondering if this represents between this first. I wonder if this represents after the first time that Billam hit the donkey because I'm not really sure why else the donkey would be facing him. Right, probably because he's just about to hit him or he just hit him. Yeah. Um, because the first time, the first time that happened, um, um, the donkey turns away from the road and goes into the field. Now, by the way, the second one they said is a, is a, is a uh, silver vineyard, there's a fence on either side where it crushes them against the wall. So it would lead you to believe that this is probably the first, the first hitting of the three. Because he's just sort of like, you know, because he's not completely, mm -hmm. one leg is still up. So he's not completely crouched. When an animal crouches on the ground, I guess they put both legs down. 
mm-hmm. and they don't move at all. There's on the way, but but it's a very interesting depiction. And and what do you see in, in Bill and Bill? He's got the whole uh, he's got the whole getup. Uh, if you look carefully, if you look in his face, his face looks very very determined to strike this animal or anger to the animal. In other words, he's focusing on the wrong thing which is going to be, of course, the crux of the whole story, these two episodes, is that people lack vision. They're looking at the wrong thing. Okay, let's take a look at the other painting. The other painting, let me just, um, I'm going to just switch here, hold on. Uh, you see the other one? Did it come up on the screen? Yes. Okay, so this painting, again, so this is done by, I looked him up actually, but I can't remember his name. His name is very German. Uh, it's called The Brazen Serpent by Julius Schnorr von Karosfeld. He died in 1872, born in the late 1700s, a German artist. And yeah, okay. So this, I mean, I guess sort of how you would, you would think. Um, here's the serpent on, on the nace. By the way, that's also a great... It's a great Hanukkah of our Torah when people talk about miracles, the word nace, the word nace really means a pole or a, really not a pole, but a standard. When I say, you know, like when, the, when they would march, the armies would march with the standard bearer that would have the flag on that pole. That's what that's called. That's called a nace. So it has to be something about a batch. Now, um, this is slightly not, um, this is the kind of thing, probably the picture they wouldn't show you in yeshiva, I'm guessing. <laughs> You know, because this is mixed seating here. So it's like, it's not, it's not much, much kosher. Um, so the snakes are all over people. This just gives me the willies just looking at it because I don't, you know, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't do snakes. Um, and there's, everybody's sort of suffering and they're dying. The people who are focusing on the ailments here, they're looking away from the staff away from the nace and what's happening. So this guy in the lower left, he's getting bitten and it seems like he's dead or the one also on the bottom is dead or these people are dying. However, the people on the far part of the picture are ignoring the snakes and it says that if you're focusing it towards heaven or towards the right thing, you know, if you look towards this then you're going to live. And then you have people, I guess, maybe this, this guy here, this guy here, he looks a little mm-hmm. bit like, I'm not sure which way to go. Like I'm, I'm with the good crowd, but I'm kind of looking backwards, right? Yeah, so he's like, so this is like, I'm torn, like, wait a minute. I, I, I get it, I get it. I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but there is a snake biting, you know, me right now. Which is interesting halacha that says, that when what are you supposed to do during Shmona Esrei if you get it disturbed? So the, Gemara, the, the language of the Gemara is that even if there's a snake biting at your ankles, you're not supposed to distract from Shmona Esrei. Oh. I don't know about you, but if there's a snake that's anywhere near me, it's even in the shul, I am so out of there so quick. I'm sorry that I'm not so religious. I really apologize for that. But I don't do snake. I, uh, you know, like you should come into my house when there's like a bug. I'm the designated bug killer. That's my job. And even like give all the Charlotte's Web explanations about how spiders are friends and no, 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 they're not, right? They're not. And they're always at the worst possible time. You have to kill a bug and it's always on Shabbos. Like, oh, I can't kill, I can't trap it. Abba, get the bug, get the bug. Ah! So these are really interesting, interesting paintings. And if you can see also, there are people that are, that are behind Moshe also. Are they like hiding behind him? Are, are they seeking refuge behind Moshe? Are they really, are they trying to get to see the snake on the staff? Or are they, I mean, it, this is, a, you know, this is what to talk about here, right? Good on you. Good, good job, Erica. Um, and then there's people like way, way in the back who are, I don't know what. Um, maybe people are trying to get closer to the, to the main snake. And that's their, that's like home base. That's safe. Look at the face you put on this side. Yeah, I mean it's 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 very menacing, very men. Even the 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 nechash and the the main snake that's yeah, saving everybody, is very very menacing. Uh, Moshe, he's holding his hand up, 
as, as it looks like he's pointing, right? Mm -hmm. I can look. Okay. This is where you have to look, right? But okay, so 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 now we have paintings. You have something to discuss at the Shabbos table. You can bring this out and say, oh, by the way, you know. But what's the real what's the real crux here? These two only two episodes in Bamidbar, maybe the whole Chumash. I don't know. You can look at some other things, but where animals are at the forefront of the narrative and they're actively involved in the narrative, but what's it really about? So I think that the key is, the key is the one line where um, it says, Vaigal Hashem es Bilam. And God revealed or God uncovered Bilam's eyes. So if I read from the great, uh, again, I would recommend um, our two animal narratives and numbers, the biting snakes and Bilam's donkey, both illustrate the power of sight to repulse and to edify. Mm. The Israelites in both the serpent and Bilam narratives were selective in what they wanted to look at, but eventually were forced to concede that the eyes take in the truth of the matter, despite what the mind and the soul may have wished to see. The animal in one number story represents the lowest human self. The animal in the next sees beyond what any human can. Both narratives are literally blind to reality and magnify the importance of vision. The animals were there to teach the humans to see themselves. Whether they learn from the animals or not is a matter of debate. That's the line. So she goes on. Of course, this is a book about, about, uh, about leadership. And in the last, and she has actually two separate chapters on this. I've combined uh, parts of two different chapters. And I'll read to you her, her closing. Uh, this is in, in chapter 11. Sometimes our eyesight fails. We justify our negative behaviors and condemn someone else's, usually those of our leaders. We look good and our leaders look weak. Instead of self-criticism, we adopt the posture of self-justification, not realizing that dishonesty is a far heavier burden in the end. Bilam, for all his inability to see danger immediately in front of him, was able to change his course and bless greatness from a distance. He showed us at a difficult intersection of our journey how much we compromised our aspirations for temporary gratification and lost sight of what really mattered. Leaders can help us gain perspective when we lose it. Leaders could take us to the balcony or the top of a mountain and offer us an alternative view of the same scenario. Sometimes it takes an outside set of eyes to see oneself with clarity. Sometimes we look better to others than we look to ourselves. By the way, that's the same thing you could use for the Miraglim when the Miraglim came back and they decided that, oh, this is how they must have viewed us, okay? Now, it's a very interesting thing because she takes, because you can ask yourself, why, what in the world is this, uh, why is this episode even in, in the Chumash, right? Like, it doesn't really, does it, but that's exactly the point, is that sometimes we need to be able to see ourselves the way other people see us, or also we can, you can, and by the way, and people have a hard time with this, but you can learn lessons from even unlikely sources. It's possible to take Musa, it's possible to take life lessons, important lessons like this from unlikely sources, and Vaharaya is when you start davening every, what's one of the first things we say in davening every morning? It wasn't a test if you daven today. It wasn't trust, it wasn't a test, right? So oh, oh, don't take my, open up any sitter. I'll, I'll take Mata Ani, mat matovu. Oh, matovu alech Yaakov, okay? <laughs> I'm taking out sitter Shiloh. You right? You want to go back? You want to go back to my circus, you know, mid-70s education? The numbers on the page. <laughs> they had it in the fifties. Yeah, they had Sidurim. The, printing, the printing, the printing press was invented then. Oh, okay, I'm right. Nineteen sixty. Okay, so the first thing it says, Seder Kima. Love that Seder Kima. Modeani, wash your hands. Reishis Chachma. Okay, you say put on tzitzis. Then you say Baruch Nafshi. Okay, putting on that. Put on your tefillin. To fill in, say all the fill in stuff. Okay, Tfila Shachris. The first thing in Tfila Shachris is Matava. Yaakov Yisrael, authored by whom? None other than our main character today, Bilam, who's known as Bilam Harasha. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me, Mister, like Sitter put it together, or people, that you couldn't find a better <laughs> opening line to the Sitter than from one of our enemies? Really? Like if I'm if I'm writing if I'm writing something about I don't know I don't know I'm trying to think like 
It's like, it's like if, if, if you were writing a, a biography of the, of the New York Yankees, mm -hmm. okay, would you open up with something from like their worst enemy ever? Like, well, let, let me do something I actually know. If I, was, if I was writing a biography of the New York Rangers, okay, <laughs> the last thing I would write was like from one of the New York Islanders would be like the opening line. Oh, and the New York Islanders, great New York Islanders once said. So that's like, what? Like, like that, that, you're missing a point. So why would we open up davening with a line that was composed of something that was intended as a curse for us and it comes out and we sing it by the way we sing it when when chas and kala sometimes when they walk down the aisle to the wedding they sing matobo alech yaakov or sometimes the chas himself will walk down the aisle this is one thing i can't stand when the when the, the pushy party planners and they're like oh rabbi you're gonna walk down there i'm like i'm not walking down the aisle <laughs> i got i'm not, I'm not i made one I'm, i made one exception once i made an exception it was actually recently um, I had to do a wedding, but it, the, the parents of the, of the groom were divorced and the father remarried and they needed time for him to get back and walk again. So I said, for that, I'll do it. I'll walk down so that you could have time so you could walk back again. You know, like people are like, did I just see you? I mean, you know how that is like, you know, you know, it's a modern family. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's just something that your enemy says has like more meaning that he says something positive. Oh, 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 you're saying good, say better. Excellent, excellent. That's exactly it. So this is what we call, this is what we call the, the Little League Syndrome, okay? It's a known fact that parents at their children's sporting events turn into psychotic animals, like crazy people, possessed crazy people. There have been known cases of violence, of terrible language, of assault, of abuse, of this and that. So you're a parent of a kid and you think your kid is like God's gift to the sport. Oh my God, my kid is the best. My kid is the best hitter. My kid is the best skater. My kid is... But what would happen if you heard it from, from somebody else? Somebody else's kid. Somebody else's kid. And they said, you know what? Your kid is great. Your kid is really good. Now that means something. Mm -hmm. If we would get up, this comes by the way from, from the, the Baruch Shamar, and many people say this, it's brought down, this is actually correct, uh, but from Rav Epstein has in his commentary on Tefillah, if we get up and say how great we are, we're amazing, we're so, well, what do you expect him to say? You're lousy? Uh, but when one of our enemies gets up and gives praise, Matovu Olech, talking about Olech, your, your homes, your, 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 your schools, your shuls, your yeshivas, your, your houses of worship, your gatherings, they're all holy, they're so great. Tovu Alecha, Mishkan Osechi, so oh, they're so great. That's exactly the point, because we have to learn. That's why this whole parsh is here. And that's why we need to learn from animals like a dumb, he's like a dumb, a dumb blank donkey, okay? Oh, but really, maybe they have a lot that we can learn from them, a lot that could teach us. But it's a very interesting thing that you have in such close proximity two very distinct episodes that deal with Animals involving teaching a lesson it has to do with vision, or I should say lack of vision. And the question is, is when your eyes are really open, do you see it or not? And this happens a lot in life. When we do see the truth of what's happening, do we have the, the gumption? Do we have the, the fortitude to own up to it? Or do we just kind of like maybe change our narrative and say, no, 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 no some, something else is wrong. Because we're going we're gonna, to, we're going this way. And I don't care what else happens. I'm going this way. You fit into it or not, okay? So really, really important, even though it seems like a very extraneous parsha, but in actuality, very, very important to the progress and the process of Bnei Israel on their way to Eretz Yisrael. So we're going to, uh, we have, we have uh, this is this is Parsha's Balak. Then we have, of course, the end of the Parsha, which we have a bit of a plague and uh, whatever. I'm, I'll discuss it a little bit on Shabbos morning. But anyway, really interesting. I would recommend, again, if you get a hold of the uh, of this book, uh, really, really great chapters that she has on this. Um, and when you see her, please tell her that I told her uh, that, that, that I spoke about it. So everybody, have a, have a wonderful day. Have a great day. Stay warm. Stay cool. Nice. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye. Thank you.